Good morning, good morning, fellowship, good morning, good morning. We're making our way in here this morning. It's good to see you. It's good to see every face in this place. If you'll stand to your feet, can we praise the Lord together? Hallelujah, hallelujah. The word says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Can you just shout out, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's coming. We're about to work it out. Come on, put your hands together. Say it. Let everything. Let everything. That has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything. Let everything.
praise you because you're sovereign. We praise you because you reign. God, you defeated the grave. You're worthy of our praise. You are the true and living God. We've come together in this corporate, this corporate time to give you glory. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. There's nobody like you in all the earth, so we've come to give you glory. Oh, yeah. Come on, lift your voice, say you, Lord, you are worthy. Come on. You, Lord, you are worthy. Oh, no one, no one can worship you for me. your heart say here's my worship here's my worship all of my all of my worship receive receive my worship all of my all of my worship here's my worship here's my worship all of my all of my worship father receive receive my worship your voice say you Lord say you Lord you are worthy
on, if he's worthy, worship him because he's worthy. Come on, he's worthy, so worship him because he's worthy. We worship you because you're worthy, Father. And to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live. To worship you. to worship to worship you I live come on come on to worship you I live I live to worship you oh we're here just for you we're here just for you to worship you to you. Be pleased, be pleased, be pleased. Be pleased with our worship. Oh, prayer. Come on, lift it up. To worship you, I live. Oh. To worship you, I live, I live. To worship you. Come on, lift it up one more time. Say to worship you, to worship you. To worship you, I live. Just to worship you. You got it. Come on, say, receive my worship. Come on, come on, all, all of my worship. Come on, we're here to give it all to him this morning. Say it again. Here's my worship. Oh, all of my worship. Father, receive, receive my worship. All of my worship, cause you, Lord, you are worthy. Come on, can you put your hands together and bless the worthy God? He's our worthy Father. He's been so good. There's nobody greater. There's no greater Savior. Come on, give God one more hand praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around and tell your neighbor, well, you made it to church. For some of you, it was easier than others. Some of you, it was rough. Now, here's the question. How many of you had every intention on coming to the 9 a.m. this morning? Hey, raise your hand. See, I knew y'all was coming. I knew I would see y'all up in here. But hey, praise God you made it. Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome to Fellowship. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church. We exist to make disciples. And um, if this is your first time here, we just want to love on you and celebrate you a little bit. So if this is your first time here, just raise your hand and we're going to give you some love. Give, there we go. Come on. What's up? Hey, y'all. Hey. 
So good to have you guys so, so much. Listen, we uh, have a great Connect Center outside. If you want to know more about our church, we love to get to know more about you. It's a great way for us to connect. Stop by the Connection Center. We love to connect. Amen? Amen. Well, we got a lot going on this month. This is Resurrection Sunday month, so we celebrate Easter on March 31st. Amen, somebody? So we are so excited about that. We want to tell you, we're doing something different for Easter Sunday, so we want to go ahead and give you a heads up. Our service times are different. So we, we changed up our service time. We're adding a service for Easter because our hope and prayer is that you would invite some people and invite your neighbor and come and let's pack out Easter Sunday. First service is at 8.30. So everybody say 8.30. First one at 8.30. Come on, where my 8.30 people at? I can hear y'all excited. Let's get the day over with. Come on. Although it's a real stretch. Y'all showing up at 11 o'clock and you 8.30 people. I kind of don't believe some of y'all. Some of y'all ain't telling the truth. All right, so 8.30, then we got 10 o'clock. Uh, and then we'll have 11.30, all right? So 8.30, 10 o'clock, 11.30, Easter Sunday. And we'll have our Thursday night service will be a unique pre-Easter service kind of leading up to Easter. And that'll take the place of our Good Friday service. So we'll be off Good Friday to reflect and spend time with your families uh, or join one of the Good Friday services that are going on at a lot of our churches, neighboring churches around in the community. Uh, but Thursday night, we'll have a special uh, pre-service. So we won't get him up out the grave Thursday night. Uh, you have to come Sunday morning to get him up, but we're going to put him in Thursday night. Uh, and it'll be a great, it'll be a great, great service. So join us if you can. Uh, that's Easter weekend. Before that, we've got just a good old fashioned old school church uh, event. We got a pancake breakfast coming up. Uh, and it's going to be here at the, at the, at the uh, fellowship center. Uh, and it's $5 per person. And it is all you can eat up to three. Um, <laughs> so I got that disclaimer outside. So, it's, 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 so come to bring a friend, bring your whole family. It is all you can eat uh, up to the third one. Then we're going we gonna to send you back. This ain't Jesus and two fish and five loaves. Uh, <laughs> this is not it. So that's, pick up your tickets outside today. We'd love to have you to fellowship. Also, we are recru- <coughs> excuse me, we're recru- recruiting volunteers for our, for our production team. <clears throat> I, I get so excited about it, I get choked up. Um, <laughs> but our production team does an amazing job. Would you give it up for our production team? <laughs> I'm just telling you, they put in a lot of work even in the round to make sure wherever you're sitting, you're able to see with the screens and stuff like that. And this is one of the few positions where no experience is required. So if you're like, I don't know how to do nothing, they're like, I'm looking for you. Um, <laughs> Come, so if you got two hands, you can move a camera, they would love to have you. And it's fun. So come and you can be a part of stuff like this. Let's play a game. Let's see if Albert can find the camera that he's on. All right, so let me see. Is it that one? Is it that one? Yeah, all right, all right. Give me another one. No. That, that, That one, there's that one, is that? Got it? All right, all right, okay. No, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's it. Is that it? That's it? Good. Some of y'all saying, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, no. No, I'm trying to follow the camera. That's it right there. That's it right there. Yeah, there, there. Good, 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 good. All right, was that the last one? All right, we got another one? Oh, wow. Right there, is that it? All right, good. See, if you join the team, you can play games like that. That's, if you ever want to know what do they do throughout the week, we do that. I come in here and say, all right, guys, let's go. And we do that, and we bet $50 per shot. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's like $20. It's not. Uh, anyway, um, I think that's it. Uh, we have what we call fellowship time. Um, and it's when we stand up, turn around, greet one another, but we don't leave you hanging. We give you a question of the day. The question of the day, we're talking about service today. What is something that you've done for free that was just amazing and you'd love to do it again? What's something that you've done uh, and, and you didn't get paid for it and you would do it again for free? You loved it doing it just that much. Tell me how you showed up for free and how it was meaningful. All right, ready? Stand up, turn around, greet your neighbor. Let's go.
Grab a seat, grab a seat. All right, all right, all right. Grab a seat, grab a seat. So, yo, what, um, tell me something that you did, that you loved, you did it for free, and you do it again. You got so much joy out of it. That's you. Anybody, raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. You guest lectured in the engineering department at USC. Excuse me. Okay. What did you lecture about? What did you talk about? Systems engineering. Systems engineering. All right. I know exactly what that is. That is awesome. I know exactly what that is. Yes, ma'am. Wow, she worked at CBS and Warner Brothers and she'd do it again for free. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm from out of town, but I volunteered yesterday for Glamour Gal. And I'm going to have a convention center. Oh, yeah. Wow, so y'all here, she worked at Glamour Gowns and kids were able to get free gowns and free suits for the prom. Give it up. That's awesome. <laughs> Now, hey, where are, you, where are you from? Virginia Beach, Virginia. Virginia Beach, Virginia. Well, yeah, excuse me. Okay, you from there, I guess. Okay, what? You just coming back home. Welcome home, girl. Welcome home. Yes, ma'am. Being a mom. Being a mom. Look at y'all. <laughs> y'all a mess. That was good. That was a good one. That was good. Yes, ma'am. Fellowship kids and you. Fellow for fellowship kids and you. Yes. What I'm talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Wow, that is awesome. Can y'all hear her? Did y'all hear her? Y'all heard her? That is awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, I volunteered to uh, help build the church uh, because part of the acquisition to uh, construction, and when we bought a gas station, and I ran gas part time while I was working for it. Wow. wow. Praise the Lord. Good volunteer. Who was that? Did I see? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. She does advocacy for domestic violence and women's shelter, and she does that for free on the board. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. I saw somebody else up here. Yes. Back when I was in Tennessee, I was a teacher in the library, and I started at Tennessee Public Library. And I was a teacher in the library. So back when she was in Tennessee, she used to be over the dance ministry because she has a dance background, and she volunteered to do that. Amen? Amen. I don't, um... I don't believe you, though. <laughs> um, so, um, come on, drop some music. Come on, girl. Come on, come on, come on. No, okay, okay, not this week. Okay, all right, all right. I'm just saying, let the Lord use you now. If you get a, you get a urge, just go on, give Him glory up in here. <laughs> No, we thank God for all the service and all the volunteers, and we'll talk a lot about this today, but I just want you to know that um, a big part of our worship uh, here at Fellowship is we believe that all that we have belongs to God, um, and we worship God through giving as an opportunity to serve Him, and just to say thank you, God, for your faithfulness and your goodness and your kindness. So we want to prepare to receive our offering this morning. Um, we'll pass the buckets in the room, but we also have giving online, giving through text messages, uh, th not text messages, through the text. Uh, you can't give just sending messages to people. Um, but um, but uh, text Fellowship Church uh, and the amount to the number on the screen there. Um, the little logo is on this, covering up half the number though. Is it 38? What is it? Is it a five? 
34, 35. All right. Oh, it's over there. You can just look over there. There you go. Um, but the, the spirit of it is um, it's how we do what God's called us to do. But I would argue giving is also how you do what God's called you to do. Uh, and that's to be a cheerful, gener- uh, cheerful giver. So I invite you to give today as we pray for our offering. God, thank you so much uh, for your goodness, for your kindness. Thank you for the resources that you have provided us with so that we might be able to give to your kingdom work. So Father, you would, Father would you receive these gifts? May they go to the continued building of your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 While we're receiving the offering this morning, I want to invite you to multitask with me. Grab your Bibles and meet me in the book of John. The book of John chapter 13. Um, Bibles, your Bible apps. We'll also have it on the screen. The book of John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. It was just before the Passover festival when Jesus um, knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas the son of Simon Assariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. <clears throat> drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands, my, my head, my, my, my eyebrows. Lord, wash everything. Um, Peter was quite dramatic. Um, verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not every one is clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have, set you, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. I pray that in these next few moments you would speak, O oh Lord, like only you can. Would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly? Would you turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us? God, it's to that end that I ask now that you stand in my body think with my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
regal, royal majesty. These are just a few of the many descriptions one might use to characterize the late and forever great Princess of Wales. Princess Diana was one of the most influential people of the 20th century. She remains as one of the most heralded members of the royal contingent in recent memory. Perhaps no one more beloved than Diana. Consider the numbers. Historians tell us she appeared on the cover of a myriad of magazines hundreds upon hundreds of times when she wed the Prince of Wales on July 29, 1981. Historians tell us her wedding was watched by 750 million people around the world. That's six and a half times the number of the people that watch the Super Bowl. When she passed away tragically in 1997, historians tell us her funeral was watched by some two billion people. One out of every three people on the planet Pauls to pay their respects. There can be no doubt Diana is one of the most beloved royals that ever lived. But what made Diana special? What made Diana alluring? What made Diana the phenomenon that she was? I would argue it wasn't just her royalty, but rather what she did with it. Diana would habitually do away with her royalty to do things royals seldom did. Consider how in 1987, at the dawn of the AIDS epidemic, when the disease was still largely misunderstood, it was Diana who made history when she famously allowed her picture to be taken, shaking the hands of an HIV patient without any gloves. This changed our perspective of AIDS and reminded us that there were people behind this problem. Consider 1997. Landmines were killing civilians all around the world in war-torn countries. It was Diana who famously walked through an actual field of landmines in Angola. This changed our perspective and spurred on the Mine Treaty, a movement that spared the lives of countless people around the world. Consider the reflections of an American doctor who remembered Diana visiting his patients. She stopped by every room to caress patients, to show affection to patients. Never once did she hesitate to embrace people with such horrific disfigurements and symptoms so gruesome that even the nurses shuddered at the task. She would habitually do away with her royalty to do things royals seldom did. One author summarized her best when she said, what made Diana's majesty so special was that in Diana, majesty stooped. What made Diana so special was in Diana, majesty stooped. In our text today, we see Jesus and what makes this moment so special and so unique, and I'd argue so rare, was that in Jesus, his majesty stooped. He took off his crown and he put on an apron, and he did what rabbis, what leaders, what those of significant influence would never do. He actually washes the feet of his disciples. This would take them aback. This would confuse them so much. This would be something that no leader would actually do. In our time together today, we've been talking about what does it mean to one another well? Um, And it's this idea of one anothering. It's this idea of loving one another. And how do we love one another well? And every week I've been talking about different ways for us to love one another well. And this week I want to talk about this idea of serving. It is through our serving of one another that we love one another well. And I would argue that this is not something that's optional. This is something that we're called to. This is a requirement of God. 
It's amazing to me, this whole idea of servant. You can follow Jesus. You can be a Christian. You can go to church every Sunday and never serve anybody. Which is dangerous to me because you can, you can miss the very essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Notice the words that jump off the page when he tells Peter, if you don't let me do this, you won't be a part of me. It's this idea of being a servant is what it means to be a part of me. So the very core of the identity of the believer is that of service. Today I want to talk about how do we serve one another in hopes that through serving one another, we learn to love one another better. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, let's love better. Come on, tell somebody, say, let's love better. As I walk through this passage, I just want to call out a couple of things that happen in the passage in hopes that we would acquire that same posture of Jesus. Um, the first thing that Jesus does is he takes off his robe. It's the idea of him removing his crown, his removing the seat of prestige so that he might serve well. Um, y'all remember, um, back in the day, uh, in order to take a good picture, um, you would take it and you had about two weeks to figure out if it was good or not. <laughs> like, because you had to go take the film, turn it in to somebody, go back to the crib, come back a week or two, sometimes two years later, because <laughs> you leave it in there and then you get it and somebody ain't even looking at the picture. Somebody ain't even looking at the camera. Somebody looking all off and they playing around. You just completely missed it. Y'all remember, anybody remember those days? Remember those days? Now, with selfies, I mean, you end up taking it 27 times. You ever try to take a group picture with a bunch of friends and everybody, then they look at it? Whenever you, whenever you take a selfie picture and you look at it, what's the first thing you look for? First thing you look for is yourself. First thing you look for is yourself. I guess what I want to say is this message is Jesus saying that's the very thing that I want Christians not to do in culture. What does it mean for you to show up and the first thing you do is not look for yourself? What does it mean for you to walk in a room and not look for yourself to be first? For you to go to work and not look for yourself? For you to go to school and go to class and not look for yourself? I'm not saying don't look for yourself the next time you take a selfie. Get, your, get, get yourself right for the gram. You know what I mean? I ain't mad at that. <laughs> but I think Jesus is saying in life, Christians, we don't look for us first. We look for others. And that's the part of the very heart, the very nature, the very essence of Christianity. It's this idea of that we don't look for ourselves first. My fear is that this is not how we're known in the culture. And Jesus is saying, there's a lot of evil in the world, there's a lot of stuff in the world, but how I combat that, how I come against that, are my Christians are deployed in the earth as, as canvases of my love and my kindness and my grace and my care. What does it mean to be curious and to look for people to serve? What, what, what does it mean? Because we're all chasing significance, we're all chasing greatness, but what if the greatest among us weren't those that were seated in the high seats of prestige and influence and affluence and power? And, no, no, what if the greatest was the one that served? As a matter of fact, there's a scene in Scripture where uh, the two guys, they're arguing about who's the first, who should, be the, who should be on the right hand of Jesus, who should be on the left hand of Jesus, and they're literally going at it, trying to find the seat in which they're going to sit, and listen to how they respond to them. Matthew 20. Uh, what is it? Matthew. I tried to play it off like I knew it. I thought it was just going <laughs> to pop up a lot sooner. So I was like, Matthew 20. Uh, 20. Yeah. Matthew 20, 24. First of all, give it up for the tech team. Look at this fancy little thing on the side over here. Okay. Excuse me. Somebody was working this week. Come on now. Um, listen to this. The response to the two. When the, when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to, watch this now, become great among you must be your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, if anybody deserves the best seat in the house, it's me. But I didn't come to sit in the best seat in the house. I came to serve the least of these in the house. I came to serve. What does it mean for you to show up ready to serve? What does it mean for you to show up curious, ready to serve? To see that as your identity, to see that as your calling, to see that as your purpose. Jesus Christ says, this is what we're about. What, what, what does it mean for you to check your ambition and your reach for the seat and for you to be seen as one who shows up to serve others not looking for yourself? Jesus literally comes in and he takes off his robe. I wore this colorful jacket so that it would be dramatic when I took it off. He takes off, oh, he takes off his royal robe and he surrenders it. Oh, and he lays it down. What, what do you need to lay down? God says, I want to use your time. I want to use your talent. I want to use your treasure. What's getting in the way of your obedience? What's getting in the way of your obedience? He says, your time belongs to me. You know what I discovered? We come up with some great reasons to be disobedient. Oh, I mean great reasons. Because God says, this ain't an option. This is fundamental to your faith. This is the very essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So serving others isn't something you do once you stumble upon some extra time, some extra cash or something like that, right? But how many great excuses do we come up with? Oh, I just don't have time. Oh, and so what you're really saying is, oh, God, I really just don't have time to be obedient today. You really want to say that to Jesus? Is that how you want to talk to him? Like we come up with these great, and and, and what he says is, what we're missing is, you do have time, but you have an allotted time. You haven't been intentional about it. Because we've spit time to the max. We've leveraged all of our time all the way to the max, and we've just left no margin. And if there's no margin, it's because you didn't leave any. It's not because I don't have any margin. No, you have some. It's just filled with stuff that you put there. But God says our life should be designed. The very design of your life and how you live should be designed with margin for obedience. There's no such thing as you seeing a need or seeing an opportunity and just having no time to do anything for anyone else other than yourself. You're missing the fullness of the blessing of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, so in your life, you should leave margin. In your your time, you should leave margin. Don't plan your calendar all the way to the edges because God may have something he wants you to do. And the last thing you want to do is be in a situation where God wants you to do something. You'd be like, Jesus, I'm booked. (laughs) Like, you really want to say that to Jesus? Like, Jesus, you know what I would? But me and Ray Ray are going to get beers at three and uh or coke it don't matter um um we're we're going to so i'm gonna miss this opportunity come on y'all but we do it all the time i'm guilty i do it all the time i do it all the time god is saying leave margin in your calendar watch this leave margin in your finances so that you might be obedient to god he says he says i've given you a hundred percent give me back ten percent that's that's not even generous. That's obedient. Did y'all hear what I just said? That's not even generous. That's obedient. We are tripped. We think just because we give that we're being generous. It's, it's kind of like this. My man, what you doing? How you doing? Good, good. This is your first time here, isn't it? Yeah. This is terrible to sit on the front row here. <laughs> You'll learn that on the second one. But it's good. What's your name? Zola. Zola? Yeah. Did I say it right? Perfect. Zola. Oh, perfect. Come on now. That's what I'm talking about. I'm, a, I'm only going to say that one time because I probably miss it up. I'm from Mississippi. My tongue get real lazy, so I don't want to mess your name up. Um, let's say I gave you $100. And, you, and, and it was a loan. I didn't give it to you to have. It was just a loan, all right? And you give it to me back, all right? So give me, pretend like you're giving me. We're going to act here. Pretend like you're giving me $100 back. Uh, that was good. Are you an actor? I wish. You would? Like, wow, that was really good. Um, 
So I get $100 back, right? And then you sitting looking at me saying, well, ain't you going to say thank you? And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, thank you, bro. But he was like, yeah, that was really generous of me to give you your $100 back. I would be like, what? Like, it's not generous for you to give back to me what I gave to you to begin with and what you were required to give back to me. That ain't generous. That's obedient. Right? Right? Some of us are celebrating the fact that we're just being obedient and you thinking it's generous. What generous is, is above and beyond obedience. So if you want to walk in generosity, it's above your regular 10% tithe. Are we, hello, y'all up in here? Y'all real quiet, it's awkward, it's weird. It's, uh... But check this out, I can hear some of y'all uh, arguing with me in your mind, talking about some, that's the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. We're not required to live unto the Old Testament, that's the law. You preaching legalism, you preaching the law, you preaching the law. Hold on, shut up, wait a second, give me a minute. I hear you arguing with me in your mind. And you know what, honestly, theologically, you're actually right. Uh, although it is referred to in the New Testament, it, it does come legitimately out of the Old Testament covenant law. But here's your problem. We're not under the law now. We're actually under grace. And grace is never less than what the law was. So to your point, grace would say, no, not 10%, but even more because grace is always more than the law. So I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, take your pro- Let's take your approach. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Here's the thing. What does it mean for us to walk our way towards obedience? And it's grace, y'all. It's grace. Some of you are saying, I can't see how I can do 10%. Oh, my goodness. I would argue, I don't know how you can afford not to do it. Because there's a blessing in obedience. And that blessing is not something that can be accounted for. Because it's greater than anything you could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes it as pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall he pour into your bosom? But, but here's the deal. If you're not there, don't feel condemnation. Receive the grace. You can't do 10%, do 6%. Do 6% and start walking towards obedience there. I'm going to do 6%, and God, every year, would you bless me to get closer and closer to 10? I'm telling you, you'll be blown away at how he blesses you. So it's okay. Everybody in here is walking towards obedience in something. Everybody ain't got it 100% right. I ain't supposed to be eating bread. I'm walking towards obedience. I had bread this morning. I don't plan to have none tonight. Thank you, Jesus. He's working on me. (laughs) You, You see the grace? You see what I mean? So just walk towards obedience. So what does it mean for you to look at your time, look at your talent, Look at your trust. Some of you, you need to use your talent for Jesus. Use your talent. Like he gave you all that talent. What does it mean for you to give some of it back to the work of the Lord? Now, and, I, and, and, and we've got ways for you to serve here at the church, and we want people to serve here at the church, but we won't have a role for each of your talents. So it's not our responsibility to find a role for you that matches your talent. Like people come to us all the time, hey, I got a certain talent, and, you know, I, I want to be used. How can I use it for the church? Well, yeah. We really don't, like, we had a, this girl, she was a, she a fashion designer. She said, I'm a fashion designer, and I just want to use my gifts. How can I use our gifts? I said, well, we ain't, I mean, you can be a, a fashionable greeter. Uh, <laughs> you can be out there greeting and, and be looking good with fashion for God's glory. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? So it's not like we going to provide that for you every time. But here's the thing. Um, you can be a fashion designer and go to thrift stores and say, hey, what can you donate? I want to go to a shelter and provide makeover for families. And I want to take clothes, and I want to give them a whole look and a whole makeover. And then watch this. Then I want to take pictures before and after, and I want to put it on the gram, and then do a GoFundMe and raise money for them so that they can be supported throughout the year. With that, Use your gift that way. And I didn't even, I mean, that was, I just made that up just now. That was off the top of the dome. That was a freestyle, dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> imagine, imagine if you took some time and was intentional about how God could use your gifts to give them away and to serve somebody. Amen, somebody? Amen. So, so it's this idea of what do, you, what do you need to take off? Like, what constraints do you need to take off? What, what 
Is it convenience? You just don't want to be inconvenient? What does it mean to take that off so that you might serve God? Is it, you, got to, you don't have time? What does it mean to create margin? Finances, what, is it, what does it mean to create margin so that you might walk in obedience? I want you to think right now. Just think right now who's somebody in your life that you could serve. And, and you don't have to go to Haiti. You ain't got to go to Cambodia. You don't have to go. God, most of his miracles were, proximity, were, were in proximity of himself. Some of you, it may be, it may be a loved one that you can serve. I mean, we think all big and grand, but just some of you, some of y'all, I mean, if you served your husband a cup of water, he'd probably speak in tongues. <laughs> he'd be like, we are going to that church from now on. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Don't be too loud. <laughs> But now, some of us, we ain't even got to go deep. Some of you, maybe it's one of your kids that feels unseen, and you just serve them. Some of you, it's your spouse. You just serve them. Some of you, it's a neighbor or a mother-in-law. Some of you, you got a mother-in-law. If you just showed up with a, with a, with a box of Diet Cokes and some, uh, some, some, some pralines or something, She'd go crazy. Her sugar would go up, so you, 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 you be careful with that. But, like, even now, just pray about, is there somebody in my life that I could serve in the name of Jesus? Maybe there's a single mom or a single dad, and you just drop off a bag of groceries at their house, ring the doorbell, and walk away. Just do it with humility. Don't do it for, don't do it for, credit, for credit. Some of y'all... Some folks, don't you hate those people? You leave a box of groceries and you write your name all on the bag with a picture of yourself, you know what I mean? Then it's on Instagram by three o'clock. They ain't even got to their house, but you already saying, look what I did for them. Come on, no, do, it, do it for God's glory, not for your own. Don't, don't do it out of ambition. But pray right now, and, and I want you to think about somebody. And I'm, I'm praying, I've already prayed for you that the Lord would lay somebody on your heart. Some of you, it's your mama. Just call your mama. She'll start crying. No trifling tale out here in California ain't called your mama in I don't know how long. You call her, she answer the phone, you'd be like, what's wrong, mama? She's like, oh, I haven't eaten in three weeks. She's like, mama, what's wrong with you? Why ain't you eating? Just in case you call, I don't want to have my mouth full. So I've been waiting. <laughs> but I, what, I, what I'm trying to do is I want you to normalize. I want to normalize this idea. I don't want you to think it's complicated. I don't want you to think it's deep. I don't even want you to think it's hard. I want you to begin to naturally just practice thinking about ways you can serve. What does it mean for you to show in the room and not be thinking about, I want to see myself. I'm not looking for me, but I'm looking for, looking for people like myself. You know what I've started doing? I, I have, when I just get a block of time and I just don't have, I don't have anything scheduled to do, I'll just take my text messages and just scroll through and look for names that'll just pop up. Sometimes I find text messages I never responded to. Anybody ever do this? I responded in my head. And if you would have asked me, I would have fought you and said, I replied to you. Because in my head, I did. I wrote out the text and everything. I just never typed it. Or sometimes I did type it and I didn't even sit sin. So it's just sitting here. And I almost want to screenshot it just to get proof. Because you know nobody ever believes you. You know what I mean? He's like, I, I texted you. I just didn't send it. And they're like, yeah, right. Sometimes I'll just look and people will, people will just pop up. And I'll just say, praying for you. And I'll stop right there and just pray for them. And ask them, is there any way I could pray for you? That'll bless somebody's day. You have no idea. So it's your time, it's your talent, and it's your treasure. It's saying, how do I use all of those for the glory of God? What do you need to take off? What, what's getting in the way of you being used as a servant of God? Second thing we see is Jesus made himself low. You got to understand, in this agrarian culture, 
it was normal for animals to walk along the streets. And if animals are there, then there is there. And many people, if they had, if they had sandals, they had sandals, but most of, many walked barefoot. So I want you to get the picture without painting it too, 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 too much. They would often step in, inevitably in animal dung, feces. Because it's not like Southern California where we walk around with our cute little bags like, oh, skip, skip, let me pick up your poop and throw it away. Oh, yeah. No, they weren't doing that in Jerusalem. They were just walking in there. So now when it comes to washing feet, you've got to understand there's dirt, there's mud, there's feces. And also remember, there's no manicurist or pedicurist. No, no nail clippers. Homies wasn't getting them trimmed. I mean, I, it's my job to make the Bible come alive. <laughs> Any of my 90s homies, y'all remember uh, Hammer Toes, Hammer Time? The hammer Time ain't got nothing on this, you know what I'm saying? Not only that, but watch this. They would sit by lounging around the table so their feet weren't uh, nestled under a table no, their, their feet would be hanging out. So it was highly possible that you would literally be sitting, eating within inches of someone else's feet. So, so the person that normally, so as we wash hands before a meal, they would wash feet before a meal. So washing feet wasn't abnormal. Who washed the feet in our setting is what was abnormal. Because normally the person washing the feet were the least influential in the house. They were the least influential in the house. So when Jesus prepares to take off his robe to wash the feet, they're like, this is absolutely backwards. You are the most influential. You're the most important in the room. Why are you washing the feet? As a matter of fact, feet were so messed up. And imagine the aroma, all that stuff. It's one of those things where it's, I call it task avoidance. It's kind of like when, you, when you're having dinner and the bill comes, and it's a big old group, and you just kind of like, I ain't trying to pay for this bill. You know what I mean? So you kind of look away, don't even look at the check, and you're just waiting on the richest person at the table all to pay the bill. That's just my, <laughs> that's just my philosophy. That's how whoever make the most money ought to be the one paying. That's why we all came, because you said you picked this restaurant. You know what I mean? Don't you hate that when you go to a group of friends and they pick like the high, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, I assume you paying then. Because uh, if we was picking, we would have been at Applebee's, you know what I mean? <laughs> they got deals designed for groups, you know what I mean? We can get two for 20, three for 30. We could have hooked that up all night, but you got me up in here in, uh, uh, in the Royal Chop House. Uh, we not doing that, you know what I mean? So you wait, and then when the person finally put their card down, it's obligatory, you got to do this. You got to be like... <laughs> Oh, oh, the bill came. Oh, oh, let me see. Let me know. What are we doing? Are we, you want me to put something? Uh, no? Okay. All right. Oh, you just, you know, I do that in about five seconds, but I just do no. Okay. All right. That's, we all right, baby. They plan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I don't even say, let me take the tip because the tip at them places be too high. So it's like, no, 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 no. I'll pay for the water. I'll cover the water. <laughs> oh, you got sparkling? You got to do that on your own now. I do, do, do. I feel like that's almost what it must have felt like when it came time to wash the feet and no lower person was there to wash it. They're looking around like, who's going to wash it? I'm not, I'm not. And then they see Jesus taking off his jacket saying, I'll wash it. What if that's how the world saw Christians? When everyone else is avoiding responsibility, avoiding taking care of the poor, avoiding sacrifice, avoiding uh, uh, standing up for righteousness and justice, avoiding being kind to people that they disagree with. What if we were the first ones that took off our jackets? and say, I'll wash uh, the Trump supporters' feet. <laughs> I'll wash Joe Biden supporters' feet. I won't, I won't be the one arguing in the office. I'll be the one washing feet in the office. 
I'll, I'll be the one with the MAGA, MAGA uh, just extreme person. I, I'll watch the feet. Everybody else, like, avoid them. I'll go watch the feet. I'll be kind to them. What if the Christians were the ones showing up in those spaces in the comment sections online saying, I'll show love while everybody else is just ripping this person apart? I'll put a prayer and a scripture in there and say, praying for you, hope, you in, hope you're encouraged. You'll, you'll never, you'll have no idea how impactful that is if you just showed up with service. Just showed up in the comment section, not looking for your opinion, but looking to honor those that might be getting disregarded or disrespected. Isn't it interesting that the greatest among us are those who serve, right? And as we look at the landscape of our politicians, they're supposed to be called public servants. I don't know if y'all watch the State of the Union and all the stuff around the State of the Union. I ain't seen no servants yet. I've seen a lot of other stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I see, I see Joe Biden having to go back and bicker with people in the audience. It's become like we wouldn't let junior hires behave, behave like that. Like, seriously, yeah. if my child was at a junior high program and somebody else was talking, even if it was a jerk, like, like little, little Robin, little Robin is a hot mess. She's mean. She's the school bully. But if my daughter was like, you're a liar, Robin, I would, like, girl, I'm about to whoop your butt. What have you lost? I'm sorry. I can't say that in California. I'm about to, I'm about to intensely speak with you in a way <laughs> that encourages you to silence and repentance before God and the whole school. Hello, somebody. Anybody was raised right? I got anybody raised right? Like, like my mother had a way of touching me and people around don't even know. But she got her arm crossed over and she didn't got my arm locked and she'll pinch it and I'm literally levitating. People thinking I'm standing up. I'm like, no, I'm being tortured by this woman. You know what I'm saying? And she'll get those lips right. She was the first ventriloquist in our family. She was like, if you don't sit down and shut your mouth, I'm going to whoop your behind in front of all your friends. Like, so I look at the landscape of our public servants and I'm like, who raised you? Well, wouldn't it be beautiful for the Christians, the ones to stand up in such a chaotic culture and, and, and say, we're the first to operate in kindness. We're the first to operate in, in grace, in compassion. Amen, somebody? Amen. What, what does it mean for us to be the first one to lean in with, here it is, with action. With action. Service is action. Feeling bad is not serving. Can I say that again? Hello, somebody. Some of you think just because you feel bad and you post something online, you think you didn't serve somebody. You have served nothing. Hello and here's somebody. You're, are we just live in a culture? To be honest, it's irritating to me. It's not, we, it's not, it's not serving, it's swerving. We, we are swerving away from real work and giving ourselves high credit for little work. Just because you say somebody's name on an Instagram post, it's, it's doing nothing for the culture. I know it's like, well, just to mention it is to be aware. Yeah, 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 that is. And it's a small impact. You give yourself some high praise for such little impact. Service, serving is not saying something. Serving is doing something. Hello, somebody? We call it activism. I call it slacktivism. You are giving yourself, you, you think you Martin Luther King because you didn't post it something online. Like, relax, boo. I'm serious, these people just think that because they, they check a box and then they're done and you're not helping nobody. You're not moving a needle on nothing. Talking about, and then, then I, I love this one. The, oh, oh, this generation, we love to do this one. Um, sending positive vibes. <laughs> a positive vibe ain't never saved nobody. Ain't never fed nobody. I don't even know what that means. This lady said, me and my family are hungry. We need food. Sending positive vibes. They don't need no positive vibes. They need some positive fries, chicken, <laughs> green beans, some bread. That's what they need. They need some positive Popeyes. Not no positive vibes. Like, what are you talking about? So that's why, watch this. Even when we say thoughts and prayers, we need to be careful 
Because my thing is, what are you praying? And the prayer should sound a lot like, Lord, use me. Lord, I see a need and it's pricked my heart. Use me. Is there a way for you to use me? With my, with my resources, with my time, maybe, my talent, my treasure. So I'm not telling you don't, don't pray. I'm not one of those. Some people will be like, enough prayers. No, no, the devil is a lie. Uh, God still does miracles, and inevitably, I'm going to need God's resources to do whatever it is that needs to be done. So I don't mind praying. But how we pray, though, could probably be a little nuanced. Instead of praying, Lord, do something, say, Lord, if you do something, would you use me? Could you, could you use me to do something in, in a way that's meaningful and impactful? Lord, use me. And then, and then, and then do, your be, do the best you got. Do the best you got. Listen, service is not fixing. Serving is not fixing. You may not be able to fix it. So the goal isn't for you to fix it. The goal is for you to contribute to it. So like, just, just do your part. And if you do your part, you might be amazed at the impact that your contribution will bring to ultimately what God wants to do. Amen, somebody? So it's the difference. It's like this, this chair needs to be picked up, right? This chair needs to be picked up. And what I fear that we have a tendency of doing is knowing that the chair needs to be picked up and posting this chair needs to be picked up. Our hearts should break. Hashtag serve. <laughs> or you take a picture of the chair and be like, yo, y'all see this chair? I did too. Hashtag what a shame. Like, it needs to be, like, like what are you doing? It's like, and, or, or you get these folks. Oh, these people are trip. They, they, they come online and go live with that guitar with a picture of the chair and say, I wrote a song about the chair. <laughs> and I just want to sing this song because it breaks my heart. I looked at the chair and it was there. <laughs> Nobody picked it up to put it in the air. What a shame. We're all so lame. Pick the chair up. It's not a game. Follow me and like me for more information and content like this. Thanks, peace. Like, what? Album coming out in the fall. It's going to be great. It's going to feature couches and lounge chairs as well. No, the chair just needs to be picked up. And the thing is, if I just, if I just pick up one corner and just do my part, would you, excuse me, would you, would you pick up that little piece right there? Pick up that, there you go. Excuse, would you pick up that? And, and then, excuse me, man, would you come here? Would you help me? Would you pick up, just pick up that part? Now, everybody just lift. Now, watch this. How, how heavy is it? Girl, you okay? Is it heavy? You all right? Your arm's shaking a little bit. You sure it's not too heavy? <laughs> you okay? You know what I'm saying? Black brother, you good? You good? Uh, okay, good. And look, look at all this diversity in the circle, too. I ain't even playing that. That was good. Look at the Lord right there. Look at that. But watch this. It's not heavy for anybody. Because we're all contributing our little bit to do a lot of it. And God is getting the glory out of all of it. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. It's a, story, um, it's a story in the Bible that's a lot like that. It, uh, in the Gospels, it's a story of, of a group of friends, and one of them was sick. And um, they each grabbed a corner of a mat trying to get him to Jesus, and they inevitably had to tear the roof off, which parenthetically is where Parliament P-Funk gets their vision of tear the roof off. The, well, never mind. Y'all get it. They tear the roof off, and they lower their friend in, and they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus says, it was all you all space that made him whole. Can you imagine with all of the faith that's in the room what the Lord can do? What the Lord can do. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Just let the way maker through. It's going to move. It's going to move. Carry your corner. If you carry your corner, we can move poverty. If you carry your corner, we can, we can move sex trafficking. If you carry your corner, we can use homelessness and poverty and food, food disparaging neighborhoods. If you carry your corner, we can move the needle for Jesus Christ in the earth if we carry our corner. Amen. And here's somebody. 
Touch somebody and say, carry your corner. Come on, tell somebody else, say, carry your corner. And hey, it's not about changing the world. Because some of you, you get so overwhelmed with the bigness of it. And, and you're trying to put yourself in God's seat, and you're not sitting in a seat of deity. You're sitting in a seat of servanthood. Just do your part. Just turn to tell your neighbor, do your part. Turn and find another neighbor. That was a week. That was a bad. Say, do your part. <laughs> there, was a, um, there was a British guy who got this unique opportunity to serve Mother Teresa in India. And um, he worked there for a year. And he's coming to the end of his time. And listen to this. He's frustrating and lamenting to Mother Teresa because of his lack of impact. He was one of those guys that got off the plane thinking he was about to change the world. He had all these ideas of all that he could get accomplished. And he's coming to the end of his time and he's lamenting how little he got done. And he's talking to Mother Teresa of all people about how he hasn't, you know, changed the world. He didn't, he didn't do anything great or grand. And while they're talking, this little boy, uh, let's say his name was, was Johnny. So little Johnny comes up and he knows that this British guy's leaving. And little Johnny was crying and hugged him because he was one of the guys that he got a chance to, one of the boys he got a chance to pour into. Little Johnny, they hug him, he rubs his head. Little Johnny runs off. And he goes back to lamenting about what little difference he made and how he didn't change the world. Mother Teresa, I loved it with all humility. She says, well, you didn't get to change the world, but you changed his. I guess what I'm saying is you may not change the world, but you can change your world. You can change somebody's perspective. You can open them up in a way that changes how they see God, how they see kindness, how they see grace, how they see people. So maybe not worry about changing the world. Maybe God's already done that part. Maybe we can change a world for his glory. Amen, somebody? Does that make sense? Last thing and then we'll go home. Here, here it is. He, for those of you keeping, keeping notes, he took off his robe. Number two, he made himself low. And number three, he asked us to do as he has done. Do as he has done. I love, I love this scene. He looks at him. He looks at him and he says, what I have done for you, after he gets done washing their feet, he says, what I've done for you, now you do this for one another. Do do this for him? Or shall I say for them? <laughs> At the end of the day, God says, we got to do it for one another. We got to do it for one another. It takes humility to do it. But watch this. It also takes humility to receive it. That was the thing with, with Peter. Peter was like, you ain't doing that for me. You ain't doing that for me. So Peter was willing to do it for him, but not willing to allow it to be done for him. And some of us, you used to serving other people. You're like, now this is my message right here. No conviction at all. Here it is. I like to hear it. Here you go. Your problem is not that you can't do it for other people, but you can't let it be done for you. And it, uh, it presents as nobility, but the reality is it's the fullness of arrogancy and pride. Did you hear what I just said? It's arrogance. It ain't noble. The fact that you can serve other people but can't nobody serve you, that's self-righteousness, boo. That's not nobility. The reality is you don't even know what it's like to sit in the vulnerable position of having someone serve you like that. It's just downright uncomfortable. So there's more control in serving. Oh, come on in here. I'm in somebody's house right now. I'm all up in somebody's house. Because, because you want to control, and there's hardly any control when people are serving you. As a matter of fact, to have people serve you is the actual admission of a lack of control, 
a lack of authority, a lack of ability. You are doing something for me that I otherwise would struggle to do for myself, which exposes me as not being, here it is, perfect and having it all together because the very nature of someone serving me suggests that I actually need help. And if I need help, then that too also suggests that I'm not some supernatural hero that doesn't need anything from anyone. Oh, I'm preaching in here now, whether you like it or not, whether you say amen or not, I'm in the house now. So Christians, we operate with this, this thing that appears to be um, uh, humility, but it's a false humility. It's not real. You, you don't let people serve you, and God says, if you don't let people serve you, then you can't really be a part of me. Peter's low-key like, I can't do that. And Jesus is high key like, yeah, you can't be a part of me then. Like Jesus, <laughs> Peter, Peter was like, no, you can't serve me. And then I can't serve, no, we can't do that. And Jesus was like, well, if you can't do that, you can't be a part of me. And then Jesus was like, what? Word? Okay. Uh, serve, uh, wash my head, wash my eyes, wash my, and Jesus was like, if you had a bath, we don't need to do all that. <laughs> like Jesus is low key sarcastic. Man. Like he's like, if you've washed yourself, that is unnecessary. <laughs> Just give me your toes, dog. Just give me your toes. Um, some of you, your biggest struggle with this assignment is um, your inability to be served, which is better translated, your inability to release control. And God says, if you can't release control, you can't be a part of me. Because the very nature of our relationship is my control. Amen in here, somebody? Amen. So God says it takes a, a mutual humility to receive and to give. I'm just slowing down right there. I got a little time. I'm just slowing down right there because I think someone gets, there are people that get stuck right there. You can help all day, but can't nobody help you. Watch this, and here's the thing. When, you, when you're in your feelings, you will even say, no one cares for me. Nobody shows up for me, nobody takes care of me, and that's really not true. You can't blame them for doing what you've trained them to do. Wow. Wow. Amen? Oh, they don't help you because you've trained them not to help you. You've taught them time and time again, you ain't trying to have nobody. As a matter of fact, it's a rule. Can't nobody even come in your kitchen to even touch nothing because you got it all the way you want to do it. Don't you come up in here. No, no, get out. No, no. He's like, no. And people be like, oh, let's go help. No, no, don't go in there. Don't go in there. Yeah, let's just stay up in here. Trust me. It'll be better for everybody. <laughs> if you don't even go up in there. So you've trained people not to show up for you because you have this image and this narrative that you just don't need any help, which is just not the truth. So in the moments when you really do need it, no one comes because you've trained them not to. So you can't be bitter at them for them living out, treating you the way you've taught them to treat you. Amen, somebody? Yeah. Let me tell you something. If nobody ever shows up for you, it's because you trained them to do that. And I know some of you, no, you don't know, no, yeah, shut up. You've trained them to do it. <laughs> like, get over yourself, tell that story to your therapist or somebody else like that. Don't come to Jesus with that, because here's the deal. Let me tell you something. Jesus is saying, in order to become friend, in order to be friendly, you've got to present yourself friendly. In order to receive needs, you've got to present yourself as needy. Now, I'm not talking about the extreme of clinginess. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about extreme, ca extreme cases of abuse. I'm just talking about how you roll. You just roll with a big old sign that says, stay back. And the fact that you got friends that honor your sign, don't be mad at your friends. Be mad at your sign. Amen, somebody? Amen. And if you want to know if this is a pattern in your life, look at your last three friend relationships that you don't have anymore. Maybe it wasn't them, maybe it was you. Because you keep taking these brick walls to new relationships. Hello, y'all looking at me a little weird. Is it awkward in here? Is it weird? Are we okay? Is everything okay? All right? Are we okay? All right, guys? All right, guys? Are we okay, guys? 
I'm just telling you, God is just saying one of the greatest gifts you can ever receive. I mean, one of the greatest gifts you can ever receive is to have somebody show up for you. And the only thing that comes close to that, and it is a top first or second place, I don't know, but it's when you get the privilege to show up for somebody. When you get to show up for somebody that really need it, and you know they need it, it's one of the greatest joys in the world. And you show up with no expectation for them to repay it back or nothing like that. You just get to be. Just get to show up for somebody. Just get to be a blessing to somebody. Oh, what joy. That's what God is inviting us to. Here's, here's the thing. It's hard to fully embrace where God is bringing you to if you don't have a full appreciation for where God has brought you from. Can I say that again? It's hard for you to embrace where God is bringing you to, the assignment that God is bringing you to, this assignment of service, if you can't fully acknowledge how far God has brought you from. It is out of gratitude that we serve other people. It is because I'm so thankful because of what Jesus has done is why I can show up for you and do for you. Jesus says, you don't even realize what I just did. I'm going home. I'm in my seat. You don't even realize what I just did. I just washed your feet, but I'm about to leave here and I'm about to go to the cross where there I won't be washing your feet. My blood will be washing your sins. And as I wash your sins, I am empowering you to walk in these now washed feet so that you may walk in the freeness of the holiness of the righteousness that I've called you to do. I died on the cross to wash your sins so that you can walk in service and righteousness. So when I serve you, I'm thanking him. When I show up for you, I'm thanking him because he showed up for me and I'm just thankful. That's why I'm serving because I'm just thankful. That's why I can bless you, because he blessed me. I'm thankful. Any thankful people in the building today? He says, that's why I show up. That's why I serve you. Because he's been so good to me, I can now be good to you. Somebody say thank you. Y'all sit down. I ain't done yet. I ain't done yet. But I want you to know what the source is. I'm not serving you because I'm so good. No, I'm a hot mess. I was rolling my eyes at you just last week. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. Key Biscayne, Florida. On any given Friday, you see a man on the shore tossing up shrimp. Name is Eddie Rickenbacker. Eddie Rickenbacker is a well-decorated World War I veteran. Uh, Served well. Uh, After that, World War II struck up and he wanted to go back and fight. But he was too old. General said, you, you can't come back and fight, but, but, but come back and I'll let you encourage the troops. So he comes back and he encourages the troops and he talks to the troops. On his way back, he's on a bomber and the plane crashes in the ocean. Eight of them survive and they're on a raft. They've now been on the raft for eight days. No food, no resources. Eddie Rickenbacker being the man of God that he is, he grabs them together. He says, let's pray. And they're praying what he believed would be their last prayer as they prepared to die. As he's praying, he closes his eyes, bows his head, and he feels what could be a seagull uh, uh, above his head. And he thinks, if this is a seagull, I could grab it, and this might be food for us. 
So he says, amen, and he grabs it, and it is, in fact, a seagull. They defeather this thing, they eat it, and they take the entrails, and they get a concoction, and they use it as bait to fish. They're being able to catch fish, and thank God they did, because they would be stuck on that raft for another 24 days. But because of the seagull, they ate and they survived on any given Friday on the seashore. Eddie Rickenbacker is tossing up shrimp. And they said if you got close to old Eddie, you could hear him saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because anytime something dies for you, the least you can do is say thank you. Thank you. Jesus is saying, I died for you. And because I died, the least you can do is say thank you. I thank you with my service. I thank you with my compassion. I thank you with my generosity. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for washing my sins away. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping me in my right mind. Thank you, Jesus, for holding my heart. Is there anybody thankful today? Anybody thankful? Come on and tell us thank you. God, I thank you. It's gratitude. It's gratitude. It's gratitude. It's gratitude. Come on and tell him thank you. It is out of our gratitude. That Jesus says, wash one another's feet. Be kind to one another. Serve one another. Not because we're so good, but because he's so good. So our life, our life, ought to say thank you. There's an old song we used to sing at my church. The lyrics were, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Would you just lift your hands all over the room? Close your eyes. And I just want the words of this song to become the prayer of our heart. Just want to lift it up. And let's just sing a little piece of it. It simply says, thank. Thank you. This is our prayer, Jesus. Lord, May my life say this, my actions, my service. It says, thank, thank you, Lord. Thank yeah. you, Come on, I just...
just take 30 seconds and give him thanks? Come on, right there. Just come on. Come on. Come on, church. Lift it up. Come on. Give thanks. Come on, church. Lift it up. Lift him 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 up. Come on. Give thanks. Go back to where he brought you from. Think about how far he's brought you and give thanks. Come on. Think about how far he's brought you from and give him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, God. May we be conduits of his grace. May we show up as servants for his glory. God, use us, God. May our life be marked by your love and our love marked by your service. For your glory, God. For your glory. If you desire prayer, our prayer team will be over by the organ in the organ area. Everyone standing on your feet, would you just stand with us? Can I just tell you, God wants to use you as servants of his power and his authority. There's someone in your life that God wants to use you to serve. Can I just say that again? There's not a person in here. I'm telling you, there's someone in your life. If you would leave this place curious and listen, I believe the Lord will just show you. How can I serve them, God? Would you just pray that prayer this week, Lord, how can I serve them? It could be your boss, it could be your neighbor, it could be your spouse, it could be your kid, it could be a stranger on the street. Lord, how can I serve them? And if you seek to be used, I'm telling you, God will use you. But Father, that's our prayer as we break the huddle um, and we go out to run the play of your love. Would you use us to serve your children, to serve a neighbor, to serve someone, and may they be served for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week.